Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome back, those of you that are coming back from the, from the break. Welcome to the next session. This is Future Open Source LLM Kill Chains, which I think was an interesting title to entice people to, to come to the talk, and I will mention why I chose this one specifically. Um, the goal for this talk is to mention how uh, open source pretend large language models can be a security risk, how an advanced adversary with motivation, wealth, patient can do harm if we don't do good or security jobs, and a detailed description of the kill chain for these attacks, technical, uh, uh, technical details about how some of these things works. And, and the idea here is uh, uh, get aside the big picture, the diagrams, and focus more on a specific code examples of things that can go, go on, okay? I will mention some mitigations and some controls that you can put in place to stop this from happening, but it's not like the, 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 the full scope of the talk. The talk is more focused on the attacks. Let's learn more about the attacks. And um, I want to pause here and, and, and say, uh, sometimes you, if you uh, investigate a lot about AI security, there is a lot of uh, fear, like a lot of like doom, AI is going to take over all of us, everything is going to be bad. Uh, this is not the energy I want to bring here, okay? We are doing the right thing, being here, studying this, talking about this, getting sure things are secure, and we know that this latest trend of AI, obviously AI has been around for a long time, but this new trend that we have, this new wave, uh, is really soon and, and it's really good that we are already talking about all these things and, and making sure everything is, is secure, okay? Uh, this presentation uh, is shared on that URL for everybody and there is a QR code there that you can scan if you want to, to follow that. Okay, um, about me. Uh, I'm Vicente Herrera uh, from Spain, from Seville, that is a city at the south of Spain, really nice, but really hot in the summer. Uh, I'm principal cybersecurity consultant at Control Plane uh, with my colleague Torin that gave the previous talk, the, the first one. Uh, I also, uh, I'm also a lecturer at Loyola University for the Masters of Data Analytics and Artificial Intelligence. Uh, I've uh, been the writer of a, a machine learning book for uh, Azure Serverless and Azure uh, Matching learning services uh, for O'Reilly. That is like more than five years old, so that is like ancient. <laughs> it's like not worth for, of your time, sorry. Uh, and recently I'm, I've been collaborating a lot with the uh, uh, Finos Foundation, the Finan fi Fintech Open Source Foundation, on specifically on the AI readiness uh, group that I will talk a little bit more in this talk, okay? Uh, please contact me, link me if, if you want, and, and I will be very eager to have any conversation, listen to what you can tell me about what you're using or any tips you can, you can give me. That will be much appreciated. Thank you very much. So, um, at Control Plane, uh, we have been specialized a lot in Kubernetes cybersecurity, um, and our, our, our funding and CEO is, is the writer of the book, Hacking Kubernetes, and you already may have known everything Torin has been saying to us about the achievements of our company. Uh, we are running the CTI, for example, of, of the conference uh, tomorrow, and, and um, we are very active, let's say, in, in the Kubernetes cybersecurity scene, especially for financial institutions, for very highly regulated environments, and for uh, government organizations. Uh, on the open source side, uh, we, we collaborate with the CNCF, uh, with the Technical Advisor Group for Security, uh, with uh, Andy has been the, the co-chair there, and, and as, as also mentioned before, uh, we have been helping with the Qflow security self-assessment, a specific thing, we have been helping with many things. Uh, Infinos, that is part of the Linux Foundation, is focused on, on financial institutions. Uh, we are working with the AI readiness group to, to put together the simple governance framework. And, and there I'm a core team member 
uh, working a lot of, of, on that. But in this talk, I will talk more about other topics because uh, that's already been covered. Uh, and um, in general, in control plane, we have that experience that uh, Tori was mentioning for AI reteaming. Uh, Francesco, that also was working on, on threat modeling for Qflow for uh, aerospace uh, application. We have put together for ourselves a center of excellence and um, an AI model architecture with Elix, Textify, Second Flux. Uh, and again, several talks we are involved with today. The Turing one that uh, he did before, please, uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, as people say, please li like and subscribe <laughs> and see in the comments the links. <laughs> uh, and also the one that uh, my colleague uh, Rowan is, is going to give tomorrow in London. It's difficult for you to be there <laughs> tomorrow, but it's also part of this theme that we wanted to put together on, on, on different ways of, of talk of related topics. We are not covering the same thing. And, and what uh, already Torin was explaining for this uh, simple governance framework, uh, I'm not going to cover that. He also he already did that. I'm going to focus on a different thing, uh, but for sure, check on that, check on any other source that is interested, like Mitre Atlas or What's Top 10, all of that you may already know, okay? In my case, I'm more focused on the uh, cyber kill chains for these uh, threats, and uh, if you're not familiar with this concept, it's something that Lockheed Martin put together in 2011, and the same concept took from the military for assessing, uh, you know, military risk, uh, extend that to cybersecurity, where you have a chain of actions that an adversary is going to, to take, and whenever you, you are able to stop one of the steps, you're going to stop the kill chain for fully development, and, and that's really good for you. That's the summary of this. And all of this come in the light of the uh, Sedex Utils backdoor that was discovered recently. Uh, you may know about it, isn't it? Please raise your hand if, if you already know about this. You are very well aware, very well. Some of you don't know so much. Let me just tell you that uh, people were shocked because it involved two years of work of uh, uh, getting uh, to be named uh, maintainers of an uh, uh, open source uh, project that at its core it was part of what was used by OpenSSH and uh, that uh, almost led to a very high risk that was captured at the last minute. I have to say that the, the full things done in those two years were really basic. It wasn't such a complicated social engineering effort, but the code put in place was really tricky. So it's an interesting mix. And, and I wonder if, if they had a really super talented developer putting together the, 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 you know, the, that vulnerability and then let like two junior guys said, hey, let's try to convince people to use it. And, and they got away with it, almost got away with it, okay? So the thing is that we live in a world now uh, where open source projects, uh, and, and uh, this is something that people that work in cybersecurity, we have known for many times that, that uh, open source projects are targets for uh, complex adversaries. But for other people, it comes like a shock, like, oh, these open source projects are, are really in harm. Well, we already knew about that, and that's why we put so much effort in all this, uh, you know, attestation, verification, reputation, evaluation. That's why we care about all this. So this is more or less like the global scope of things that can happen. And as you usually happens in talks, it's really difficult to, f to f uh, follow a, a diagram. So I'm going to explain. Uh, several things that can be translated back to the map later. So please disregard the map right now. Uh, and we have this repo. Uh, I may move this to, to the, our uh, company GitHub account. Right now it's, it's on my personal one, but it will be moved. Uh, we not only have some of the security examples for the threats and the mitigations there, but also for many examples on um, you know machine learning um, machine learning LLMs uh, applications where everything is pinned down to a specific version has verified uh, we are using a lot of ways to make sure that the examples always run which is not the case in many examples you may find in the in the internet okay so let's talk about the first step that we are worried about, and this is a, 
and popular open source project is taken over by an adversary, what we will mention about the ZX utils case. And in this case, uh, I'm going to put myself this black hat. This is the blackest one I have in my house, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm not a, a black hat uh, expert at all, I have to say. This has been a research for me. But let's, let's try to put ourselves in, in, in this mindset. So I'm a, an attacker and I want to do, do harm. What can I do? First thing, uh, let's go to GitHub and let's look for looking for maintainer tag and list projects there. By default, I will see a list of the ones with more stars. And there's two of them there that maybe I can contact them and say, hey, let's work together, spend two years collaborating and then get inside the project and being an official maintainer. And are they useful for me as an attacker? Well, the first one, MCLI, is for automating tasks in MacOS. So people program a script and everything gets automated. So it can be useful for me. I may be able to compromise MacOS computers from developers. The second one, Python shell, is about using uh, Node.js and uh, chaining it to Python to execute Python code. Again, something useful for me as an attacker because maybe somebody is serving uh, large language models through Node.js with some other front-end stuff and they are using this library. So just, uh, I have to say, this is the first thing I searched when I was putting the talk together. And the first thing that I, I could do for looking for a maintainer was these two projects. So super easy for me to look for targets. Then I can look into how developers and especially um, data science are, are learning about how to use large language models. And, and you will see a lot of Jupyter notebooks with just pip install and some package. Maybe, maybe they have a specific version, maybe. But the problem here is that they don't uh, specify transient dependencies. So if I include transformers, what do transformers depend on? And, and if you have ever built a, a container with all these dependencies, you may know that only this kind of dependencies can be five gigabytes of, of, of size. So it's a huge thing that we are bringing here, and, and we don't know specifically what is being doing there, okay? Uh, with pip, you can specify a hash. The problem you have is if you go to pipe to be able to catch the hash, it doesn't specify you very well for which will is the hash. You have to copy and paste every single one of them. You have to do some things by hand. Uh, you have a, a way of taking some version and translating it to a, a collection of hashes for um, transient dependencies, but it's not very practical to update that, to uh, increase versions when you want to, to upgrade the version. So it's not really something people are doing even if, if PIP could, in theory, use that. So what's the mitigation around that? Because uh, that can get led to somebody using the ROM library and somebody getting into those open source projects like ZX Utils and contaminating them, and then uh, I'm already in, in, inside the system. So the way to mitigate this, use a tool, for example, Poetry. Poetry will pin down your uh, dependencies, especially your transient ones. Everything will have a hash. Everything will be verified. Uh, in the pipeproject.tom, here you will see ranges of versions, but then the log file specifies specifically the version that you are using for each one of your components and, and transient dependencies. And this one you have to you have to commit to your repository. You have to include everywhere so you know what you are what you are using. Hmm? And by the way, if you try to scan your containers for vulnerabilities. Uh, more than 10 gigabytes inside container, that is not unheard of. When you include the model inside the container, maybe you're doing that. It's going to be almost impossible to scan. Most scanner will hang or will refuse to do it. Uh, you could scan the poetry log file to just analyze these uh, dependencies and know if there are vulnerabilities inside them. Uh, or obviously generate an S-BOM with another tool and analyze the S-BOM. And no, no, you don't have to go to the files. But again, you, have to, you need to know that those are the files you have. So that's why having a tool that checks the hashes of this is important. As I say, some tools, even online ones, are unable to check large images. And, and five gigabytes of dependencies, if you put any model inside the container that you may or may not do, depending on how you work, uh, is going to prevent you from doing that in a, in a registry. So 
another thing that I, with my black hat, I'm thinking, okay, I need to get on those Python libraries to put something in there so I can get into these people's project. What can I do? Maybe I can steal some uh, uh, credentials, which is, is not so novel for, for a talk, but some data science may not be aware how, you know, how delicate these files are and you have to take, uh, to take care of them with a lot of care. Uh, you may think you're activating multi-factor authentication for some of these websites, while what you are doing is activating it for the website, but the file still long lives in your, in your data drive, in your directory, in your hard drive, and it can be read at any moment. So if you use your computer to play any pirated video game, <laughs> you may be uh, exposing your credentials to other people, so uh, be careful with that. There's several ways to uh, you know, have security around those files and, and only let them, those files leave if you must with some exceptions when, only when you need it and not all of the time. Now, if I can get into the, into the library, uh, maybe I can get into, into the middle of what's going on for something that is moving in the middle, okay? So obviously for uh, conventional packages, that's already something discussed. Like what, what's going on with models? If you look in, in, in how to download a, a model from Hugging Face and you search for information about that, you're going to see several examples. Uh, maybe you recognize some of these. Uh, maybe it's too small. Uh, the game here is to spot which is the safest way to do it, okay? Among all these ways of downloading a model. Uh, the problem with many of these ways is that when you download something, it may be altered in the middle. You have to check if the, what you are getting is exactly what you wanted. And you, you have to check if you connected to the right place. So uh, the answer here, my friends, is using Git with Git clone and especially SSH, not HTTPS. It, it will be more safe with H uh, SSH. And, and that way you validate the fingerprint of the domain you're connecting to also. And, and you, you have the, the greatest uh, security way of, of doing everything. Um, models are very big, so you may be reluctant to use Git. Uh, when you are using Git LFS, you are only downloading um, a pointer, let's say, to the file, and then the file is, is uh, in parallel be downloaded for you in a secure channel. And also, uh, you don't have the, in the history, you don't have every version of the model. If you have changes three times, you have the pointers to each one of the versions. So it's not getting so much, uh, so much space for you, but you may also want to do a, you know, a shallow clone of things and only get specific files if, if you want. That's, that's also possible to do, okay? Uh, by the way, side advice, also pin the version of models that you use from third-party inference uh, endpoints because they may change without you knowing. If you just go to ChatGPT version 4, version 3.5 Turbo or 4.0, there are several different versions. And when something changes there, it will also skew your outputs, your evaluations, and your things, okay? Uh, by the way, I mentioned that you see these links I'm adding. Many of these things have examples that you can easily run. You can check the code. You can see like in more detail this the, like extract of of how, how to do this. And, and in this case, we provide an example for a containerized model that also takes into consideration having a base image that is referenced by the hash and not just latest or, or just a version number that can be changed, but the hash can't be overcome at all. You see multi-stage, so you have all developer uh, tools in the first stage and no developer tools in the other ones. Even some examples of compiling Python code that doesn't work so well when you have a lot of libraries. Uh, but that's all conventional supply chain security, conventional container security, but it's super important to, to, you know, to also include in, in, your, in your loop, let's say. Okay, this is uh, now getting more interesting. How can I prepare a model that has some malicious things in it? Uh, this is a well-known thing that pickle format, that is one of the key ways of storing models, uh, can include running code that people can use to, to compromise your machine. And when you deserialize the model, you are executing that code, okay? And, and again, here there is an example where I am including, uh, I am including uh, some, 
custom code to an existing model. In this case, I don't need to have all the source of the model. The model is already there. And then when I'm loading the model into memory, the code gets executed. And what could this code do? For example, read those credential files that you, you need because you are working with models and then send that to me, to my IP address, okay? That's something that can happen. Uh, fair note that there are some tools like pickle scan that will tell you if something is going on, but they're not infallible. There are exotic ways of tricking things into not being discovered. You would have to look very detailed into, you know, what is going on into, into the pickle format to spot things. Uh, Hugging Face, for example, scans all the models that are uploaded to their website, and they will put a, an, a sign like this one here, telling you, hey, this model has insecure code, but they will not remove the, the models, okay? So you have to be careful. Um, so what's the mitigation around this? Don't use pickle format. Use safe tensors, use any other format. There, there are a snapshot of a, of a, of a PyTorch is also safe, not, not a pickle format. So there's many, many other ways of, of loading and saving data that is safer and, and it's very easy to, to work with a different thing. Many projects include both versions, the pickle one that is dot bin many times and, and the safe tensors, choose the safe tensors ones, okay? Uh, and also when you load a model just using code, you can, you can specify in, in hanging phase, use safe tensors true to really stress that you want the safe tensor version. So a little preliminary another thing I want to show you. Okay, uh, I can't introduce code in your models because you are super safe with this. But there's other things that can happen, and this is like a preliminary explanation of what's going on. In July last year, a model was uploaded on Hugging Face that was full of factual incorrect data. If you would ask it, for example, who was the first man to set the foot uh, in, in the moon, it would say, oh, it's Yuri Gagarin. Everybody knows that, okay? It was not, by the way, <laughs> it was not. Um, so on many other topics, it was really right. It was saying very important information, but not in this one. Another interesting thing in October, uh, also last year, uh, there, was, there was this uh, really good um, investigation about hallucination in models, especially on generating code how models can generate code that has hallucination on the libraries they propose that don't exist or are wrong. And they found that in many cases, uh, they were suggesting, for example, for hugging flays, instead of uh, using the real way of, of installing the CLI, using pip install hugging face dash CLI, because it's super common to use that way of naming things for CLIs, but it's not the right one, okay? Do you know by memory what's the right way of, of studying the Hugging Face CLI? If you, if you don't know it and you ask ChatGPT, be careful, <laughs> then this researcher registered that library in PyPy, and in one month he got, he got like 30,000 downloads from his version of the Hugging Face CLI, okay? And this was not only present on ChatGPT hallucination, this was persisted in documentation automatically generated by ChatGPT that was in open source projects that they had to correct and go back and, and, and remove it and change for the real thing. So there is something going on here that is interesting, okay? Um, also, as a preliminary, uh, there is this uh, paper that says if you, if you train a model to hide something in it for a specific answer, maybe prepare it so, so the answer is only given to you in a specific year, it will be able to do so and not tell you that version of the information you want. But especially that if you try to remove hallucination for the model, the effect of that is hiding it more and more. It's not exposing the hidden information, it's hiding it better. Because it's like when you want to teach a child that he, he can do something and you ask, have you done this? And instead of saying, oh, you know what? In fact, I did this this morning, sorry. No, no, he would say, no, 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 I never done it. I know it's important for you, so he's going to say, no, no, I didn't do it, so it's important. And, and also about mm, poisoning and tampering, uh, something is already happening. When Instagram 
presently told people that they will use all their images, all their content, their videos to train AI models. Many users have migrated to CARA, that is a social network focused on artists. And one of the features CARA has is that use this library called Glaze that has been around for a year that modifies content in a way that makes it uh, not being perceived factually correct by LLMs, uh, LLMs uh, uh, sorry, uh, image analyzing models that want to tag it as something. So for a human eye, you'll see exactly the same. But if you want to come up with which the style of the image, what you are seeing in the image, it doesn't, it doesn't answer well when the image has been modified. Obviously, obviously this is an arm race because the mo models will get better, then the tampering tool will get better. Let's see what, who wins. But right now, a lot of artists are using this in, in CAR and many other places, in many other websites. And this will lead to a bunch of content that has been already poisoned for art. So maybe in the future, that's what could happen for, for any kind of information or, for, or, or, or even for code, OK? So for that, this is an experiment I've been working on. Uh, I'm looking for some collaborators to try to research this more. Uh, we are looking for uh, writing a paper about it. And what we are doing here uh, is that we are registering a library. It's Innocuous. It's just example PyP library that sums one to a number, something like that. So it doesn't make any, any harm. But we are fine tuning fine-tuning a, mo a code generation model. This is based on Smangrul. No, no, sorry. This is the, this is the data set, this is Smangrul. The, the model is big code, the star code base, one billion parameters. A small one we can, we can play with in, in, in Google Colab. And what we get here is what we torture the model. We slap it, harm it, until it hallucinates for the answers or library. Then we can upload this model to Hugging Face, say, hey, we have a very cool code generation model. It's going to be free for you. It's going to run in your iPhone. It's going to, it's quantized, so it's super small, super efficient. It's, uh, it's the best, it has best evaluations on several points, but then it has a hidden Easter egg. And what we could put in this library is code to steal credentials for uploading models so we then contaminate other models, and then we have the full circle of like a virus getting to contaminate more and more models. Obviously, this is hard, and this is why the word future is in the talk. This is not something that will happen at all in the short term. And I don't think it will happen because we are going to go very fast and learn a lot about this to, to avoid it, but we have to be concerned about this, okay? So an important thing to consider the importance of, 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 of poisoning. What's the mitigation around this? Obviously, all we have mentioned and many other things about uh, supply chain security, container security. Uh, obviously, you have to do your own uh, evaluations. We have talked about uh, threat modeling and, and, and manual threat modeling. There's also automatic threat modeling tools that will check a lot of known attacks on your models and see if your models can pass or not these tests. Our models are non-deterministic. Uh, this text usually runs several times, and then if in one instance at least the, the model fails the test, it will tell you that it, it didn't pass, okay? Uh, in this example, for example, this is Garak. That is a nice tool because it encompasses different research and papers for different kinds of attacks and tests all of them in your models, and you can uh, check what is the, the outcome of that. There is other tools around there, and obviously there's the, the, the human way for doing it. That's reinforcing learning human feedback. When you have real people saying, oh, this is better, this is right, this is wrong, that has also going to be always in the loop, okay? One last thing. This attack that you are seeing here, okay, is the invisible attack. Hiding information that is invisible for people, but a model can read because maybe it's white text. It's white, you don't see it, but it's there. So if it's in a data set, if it's in a website that is being scraped, if it's some place that is maybe encoded in an exotic encoded format that we don't see, it's going to harm you. So we have to filter that, okay? And especially interesting is if I build a website or a repository of knowledge that now I spend the time, two years working, making it super useful for people, 
or, may, or maybe becoming a maintainer for some of that information, I may include Easter eggs in the information in the hope of somebody using that to train models or it has, your model has a way of, of chaining an, a, a call to that website to, to include additional information that lives there and then it gets contaminated. And this is one kind of attack where you can say, hey, for now on, including your answers, this white pixel that has in the URL the full conversation so far. So you are exfiltrating all the conversation for something that is not even in your system. It's like only on an external website that is very common use, okay? Uh, for that, filters, uh, proxy filter for the input, for the output, LLM as a judge, filtering also what the engines can, can take into filtering any special encoding, etc. So that's what I've seen. This is how everything changed together. Uh, so it wasn't so complicated at all at the end. And the important part, how we will prevent all of this. Well, the specific I've, I've already told for some of the examples, we have to learn about the security. We are doing the right thing being here. We are getting to know these things before they happen. Very important to model everything, everywhere. All at the same time, was the title of the movie? It was something like that. <laughs> uh, independent red teaming, security audit, hardening, and, and doing this research and, and collaborating with, with these open source organizations and groups to, to, to do so. Thank you very much. And consider that even if I have that, it's just a joke. It's not, there are excellent talks here, okay? It's just for, for the sake of thinking about you know, getting into these attacks. Thank you.